skip the formalities and get straight into this. What is Let's Play? Well, it's a webcomic. It's got romance with lots of references to games, anime, memes. Oh, and it is very horny. Lots of fan service all around. For both genders. Nice. My goal for this video? Well, I was rereading Let's Play and kept thinking about how cool it would be for it to be adapted into an anime. And then I kept thinking about it nonstop. So I'm making this video to outline what I think a Let's Play anime might be like. How much of the story would be needed to fill up one season? Go into detail for the first three episodes. Mostly a step-by-step -step process of how the story would go from comic to animation. Disclaimer. My knowledge of how an anime is made is based off of watching Shiro Bako several times and having been watching anime and anime content online for about half of my life so far. Now, I'm going to be spoiling the story to get this done. Not all of it, but at the very least half will be spoiled for sure. If you're not into that, you can go and read Let's Play on Webtoon for free. I'm not being sponsored, just letting you know where to go and what to do to do the thing you might want to do. As of writing this script, we got three webcomic anime adaptations already. Those being Tower of God by Aniplex, Nobles from Production IG, and The God of High School by Mappa. The quality of these adaptations vary, but the point I'm trying to make with this is that when considering which studio to hand over the adaptation to, going with a studio that is familiar with adapting webcomics may already be a plus. But this doesn't account for other possibilities and what will need to be done during the adaptation process. Since these three adaptations are more along the lines of fantasy and action rather than the slice of life romance that Let's Play is all about. For this, I think that Brainspace would be a good candidate for adapting Let's Play because of their previous work on Watashi ga Motete do Sunda, another romance story with a nerdy main character and not being adverse to male and female fan service as well as having a member of the main cast being a lesbian who is actively going after the lead character romantically. The creator of Let's Play, Mongi, has stated in one of the Q&A chapters that there is a queer character in Let's Play, but as of this writing, they haven't been revealed. But knowing that there is going to be a character like that eventually, it would be a good idea to have the foundation of the anime be with a studio whose staff is comfortable with those characters. For the record, when it comes to who the character is, My Money Part 1 is on it being this boy, and My Money Part 2 is on him being bi. Lastly for this section, I want to bring up how it may be good to get with a studio with animators who could more easily draw in the style of Let's Play. The art in Let's Play has some thicker outer lines, while most modern anime stick to using thinner lines. Now, I say most because there's at least one anime in the spring 2021 season that goes against this norm. That being Subarashiki Kono Sekai by Shin A Animation. It's an adaptation of a video game by Square Enix that has a similar art style to that of Kingdom Hearts characters. Thick outer lines and certain facial structures. Some of the animation was janky, but for the most part it looked really good. In what I've seen of the anime, they also have utilized CG animation for some fight scene cuts, but they cel shaded the models to look more like 2D animation. There are some plot threads in Let's Play that take place in a video game, and I think using CG for these segments would stylize them and help separate them from the slice of life world that the characters live in. I'm not going to say that this is enough to decide to go with this studio for the adaptation, but knowing that their animators are familiar with thick lines and how to animate them may be useful. If possible, the solution may be to choose another studio to handle production, but try to contract some animators that have worked on Tsubarashiki to work on Let's Play. That's probably the best thing. Now we got a studio! What's next? Well, the production team needs to get familiar with the story which they are going to be adapting. Reading and rereading through it to understand the plot beats and how they work, where the characters start and where they end up. Most importantly though in this case, the references. Many a reference and meme is brought up and integrated into Let's Play. That is, many Western memes are referenced. The game references, I'm sure, at least half are Japanese in origin, 
but it would be helpful to find out which ones are being referenced specifically. Japanese online media has a different meme culture than that of Western audiences. So the member of staff who has to do research on the memes and references in Let's Play may end up missing some valuable information. This is just a suggestion from myself, but it might be helpful if the creator of the comic who knows all of the references and memes were to, say, make a folder with all of the information about references and memes to give to the production team. That may prove to be most useful to them. Ideally, the end result of adapting something from a still image into animation would be a win-win scenario. Looking like the original work while also being easy to animate. Another idea would be that the original creator would be able to be involved with the process each step of the way. It is important at this stage to decide what aspects of the original art to keep. The part that makes it recognizable to fans and helps it stand out against the competition. I've mentioned before the thick line work of the webcomic, but the real thing that helps Let's Plays stand out and probably the most important thing to get right would be the faces. Mongi has a certain way of drawing eyes and mouths that help make her characters expressive, and give them a trademark appearance that screams, Let's Play! During this part of production, it would be up to the character designer to make the reference sheets for the animators to look at when drawing a cut. Especially because their art style has changed as the comic has gone on. Comparing the first few chapters to chapters later on, you would think they were done by two completely different artists. I'm sure Mungi has their own version of these sheets that they use when making panels for the comic, and I think it would be helpful to share those with the production team. But it is important to know that the reference sheets that Mongi uses might not be suitable for animation. For an anime character sheet, even the slightest difference in line placement can make a huge impact on how the design comes off to the audience. There are three key aspects of anime that help bring everything together. The character design, the world design, and the sound design. I've already covered the character design, and I will talk more about sound later. For now, I would like to address the world. In the original webcomic, some of the background art was done using digital assets. I believe this was done to make producing new chapters easier for the artists, but it can have the effect of making it seem like the characters don't belong in the world that they inhabit, not really seeming like they are touching and interacting with everything around them. I think it will be important for the anime production to work with a creator to establish a definitive world design that can match the design of the characters. It is also important to take into account where the story takes place. In anime production, there is a pre-production process known as location hunting, where the design team goes out to real-world locations and takes photos for reference. In the webcomic itself, we haven't gotten a name drop for where they are exactly, only that they are in California, and that they are a few hours away from Yosemite Park. So, roughly this area, I think? Once the team has a location to work with, they can get the pictures and reference material they need in order to recreate the city they live in and what the background culture of the world will be. What people live there and how they act, anything and everything possible to make a high-quality product for the fans to enjoy. Once pre-production for the art is underway, it is then up to the studio to hold auditions for voice actors for the characters. While I don't know where Mongi lives, I'm pretty sure they aren't Japanese or live in Japan, so it would be very difficult and costly for them to be present during this process. But that doesn't mean they can't be directly involved. I imagine that Mongi already has their own headcanons for how their characters should sound or what sort of archetypes they fill in. For a majority of the characters, I don't think anything special needs to be done, but several characters come to mind where there might be some issues in casting and translating the comic to anime. These are just my interpretations of the characters, so don't take them as gospel. Jacob definitely comes across as someone who might be doing drugs. That's rude. Really, they're just very chill and casual, even in a work environment, using some slang words as well. I have concerns over how this would translate into Japanese. Like, what would the Japanese equivalent of Jacob's archetype be like? Another thing of note is accents. 
Later on in the story, a Spanish character makes several appearances and is close to one of the main characters. So he's basically a part of the main cast, at least for now. There are times where he speaks in Spanish and it is implied that he has a Spanish accent, but I've already mapped out season one and this guy won't be making an appearance. Oh well. One person who does make an appearance and likely has an accent of some kind is Lucy. Yes, I know. She's American and probably has an American accent. The question is, which one? We're in California, so is it a Californian accent? Is she from New York? Or somewhere a bit more obscure like, uh, Wyoming? Personally, when I read her texts, I imagine a voice like Christian Shenoweth coming out of her mouth. It just fits, you know? My darling, while you sleep, all is well. We are friends, and that's swell. But the truth is that I have a secret to tell. Elfie, now that we're friends, I've decided to make you my new project. We can make friendship bracelets out of shells, and picture frames out of shells, and decorative waste baskets out of shells. When it comes to the main cast, the character I would like to address first is Charles. It is stated in the comic that he is Welsh, and there are multiple occasions where he speaks Welsh. It's mostly off and new, but that doesn't change my point. Charles is a main character and love interest. The voice actor who plays him not only has to have a vocal range that fits Charles as a character, but they also need to be able to speak Welsh. Thankfully for the actor, Monkey has given them an out by having Charles address how he knows his Welsh isn't as good as it used to be, so it's okay for the actor not to be 100% fluent in Welsh either. Thankfully, again, in recent years, anime has gotten really into isekai stories, or stories where someone is transported to another world. In most cases, it's a fantasy world, and in some of those cases, the characters in the fantasy world speak other languages. Like in Mushoku Tensei, when the main character learns how to speak Demon God, and during the last arc of the show, uses that language to talk to most of the other characters in this strange land. Or a reverse isekai show like Hataraku Mao-sama, where the fantasy characters come to our world and start out speaking another language and learn how to speak Japanese afterwards. The point is that there are plenty of voice actors on the market now that can convincingly speak another language, even if it's a made-up one. Now, of course, a very important role that needs to be filled in is the main girl herself, Sam. Sam's character arc throughout Let's Play is learning to be more confident with herself and her body, so it will be important when looking for an actress to find one who has the range of shy and meek to bubbly and... Well, maybe not loud, but louder, you know? But maybe loud is the best way to describe it. <laughs> I brought up Watashi ga Moto de do Sunda before. I think that voice actress might be a good fit. Having a cute voice while also knowing how to take it into the bizarre and thirsty. <laughs> but I would also like to bring your attention to Nenju no Susume. In this anime, the main character goes from working a desk job to becoming a neat and falling in love online. When interacting with others outside of her safe space at home, Mori is more quiet and nervous. But in her home and her mind, she can be eccentric and goofy. But now we must address the most important characters that need to be given voices. Bowser and Dina. These are the money makers, okay? These are going to be what most of the plushies and keychains will be based off of. 
It is of the utmost importance that the voice actors chosen for these roles are able to bring their characters to life and lean into their personalities and charms. Bowser is a very good boy. Sam's protector and friend, and also her child. Such a range must be showcased in full. Bowser's breed is also an important factor in casting. How does he bark? Is it a high register or a low register? Does he snarl and snort due to his short snout? Just how expressive can he be with just the sounds that he makes? All very important things to ask. And Dina. Olivia put it best in that she is so ugly that she's cute. She also has a complicated origin for her birth and how she is the way that she is. The conventional way of barking just won't do for such a queen. My voice will have to do for now, but I imagine Dina sounding a bit like... Oh, oh, there's a fly flying around the room, why? Oh, 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 oh. Both weird and funny, but fitting in a way that can boost their cuteness. Before we go any further, I think it's time we address the copyright in the room. I'm sure part of the boring legal side of adaptation will involve some paperwork giving the studio permission to use the characters and story and animation and all that. Where the issue here lies is that Mongi has used characters from other webcomics in her webcomic. With permission, of course, I think. Characters from Winter Moon and Darby were used in some chapters of Let's Play. The Darby characters were used as Super Smash Bros. replacement characters. And the Winter Moon characters we use as characters in one of the top three guilds in the World of Warquest game in Let's Play. I think there are a few options here, but I personally think there's only one good option. To use the characters as they are now in Let's Play, either the creators of Winter Moon and Darby need to find a way to fill out the paperwork to give permission to use their characters in the anime while still having ownership over them, or they need to sign over the rights to their characters entirely. This has the downside of hindering the ability of these series to be adapted later on, or possibly make it so that they can't even continue with their own comic. In a webcomic, it's easy to give a quick shout out at the end of a chapter and point the reader in their direction, but this isn't something that is common in anime. Really, the safest thing to do, and the thing that I think is the best option, would be to just make new characters for these sections. Have them serve the same purpose, but avoid having to deal with a bunch of copyright paperwork and bullshit. On a less serious note, time to finally talk about sound design! The studio will be in charge of getting composers for the background music, and the sound design team will take care of the sound effects like the sound of shoes on concrete or shuffling and organizing papers and clacking away on a keyboard. One thing that I have noticed is that Japan really loves using sound effects. <laughs> like, a lot. The important thing here, and why I'm talking about sound in the copyright section, is Mongi's music. Webtoon has a feature that allows creators to play music over chapters, even have the music start playing once the reader scrolls down to a certain point. In adapting Let's Play, the question needs to be asked if Mongi's music will be used or not. I think it should. But I can also recognize that there's some music that is simple by comparison to what is used in anime. So I think what might have to happen is that Mongi will sign over the rights to use their compositions for the anime and have a Japanese composer use that as a base for the music that they create for the series. Win-win! Now that we have a strong foundation for the production as the adaptation gets underway, it is time to start actually writing the episodes. It's obvious, but writing for a webcomic and writing for television are two completely different beasts. In a webcomic, it is very important to make sure the reader gets hooked in and wants to keep reading, so rarely, if ever, does a chapter end with everything tied up neatly. Or everything from the previous story was tied up neatly, 
but the next arc starts and gets the viewer interested in what's to come. Typically, in anime, an episode will have all of the relevant plot beats be resolved by the end, but for an overarching story, maybe one or two things will be left unresolved, or something might be set up to be paid off in a later episode. With my limited knowledge of Japanese and my experience in watching anime over the years, I was able to come up with a formula for how the episode should be structured and what time frames need to be written around. Yeah, a lot of it is obvious, but it, I, I just made it more complicated than I needed to. Whatever, just listen, okay? Of course, we have a 90 second OP and ED, so that's three minutes of screen time covered. The next episode bumpers at the end can vary in length, but it's usually only a few seconds long. I was thinking that the episodes would have 20 minutes dedicated to plot progression, and after the ending credits, have an after episode short series called Bowser's Adventure! A recent trend in anime is to have little shorts at the end of episodes that have the characters be put into comedic scenarios, or even to help characterize them a little further. Jujutsu Kaisen and Mighty Masha Irma-kun are great examples of these. I was thinking that this part of the episode could be given to our favorite pupper Bowser and his antics. Just a little side stories about what Bowser gets up to on a daily basis. There are a few Bowser-centric scenes and chapters in Let's Play that I think could be used for this. Like how Bowser is watching TV and learning about corgis. Or the time some squirrels tricked him into running into the window and he broke his favorite princess doll. And a Bowser and Dina side romance. You can't trick me. I see those blushies. They may never have children, but they may have hope. Just show some bits in episodes where the two interact, but instead of focusing on the humans, put the focus on the dogs. Like at the dog park and later on when Dina is over at Sam's house with Bowser. I am imagining the adventure short being something like... Baby, I love you. Baby, I love you. You're so fine. Baby, I love you. And we could get more Bowser backstory. Like, he doesn't like strangers. But why? When did Sam get Bowser? How old is he? What made her choose him? Pet store or shelter? Monkey should use these one-minute sections to their full advantage to market the good boy. For the opening, we're going to need something upbeat. It's a romance story with fun references to games and shit. A fun premise like that needs a fun OP. Show off the good aspects of the characters. Sam is the main character in the middle of it all, but she has wonderful and fun friends and family, sexy love interests, and an adorable pupper. I think the OP should be used to highlight what the characters do and like. Sam with her gaming. Angela likes to be fit. Marshall is a YouTuber. Charles is efficient with his work and also a huge base of support for Sam. Link is also a fitness junkie but is an EMT on top of that and works at a coffee shop. Basically just focus on all the positive aspects of the characters and their roles and environments. For the music, I was thinking something like... <laughs> Or Or maybe even Really, the possibilities are endless, but having a base and inspiration doesn't hurt. Now for the ED. I was thinking of taking it in the exact opposite direction. More melancholy. Because most, if not all, of the characters in Let's Play also have their dark sides. Angela with her rage and shame. Link lost his father. Charles is divorced. Marshall is depressed. And Sam has huge self-confidence issues. I don't really have an idea for the music like I did for the OP, but I do have an idea for what the visuals could be. It's nighttime, and each character is being kept up by their vices. Maybe looking out the window, or drinking some alcohol in their living room. For Sam, I have this visual of her lying in bed with the focus of the shot being on the scar on her neck. 
the symbol of everything she has had to go through. Having an ED like this would pique the viewer's interest, make them ask questions. Why did he look so sad? What's going on? What happened? Make it all grayscale, too. Make it very different from the show proper to get the investment and interest pumping. Even if what the characters are sad about is obvious, the audience will still get invested in learning more about it. If Link is holding a photo in a picture frame and frowning, then people will wonder who's in the picture. If Charles is having a drink while the ring on a chain is in his hand, people will wonder what happened to his wife. If Marshall is at his computer just spacing out and his eyes are all gray, those interested in him will wonder why he seems to be dead inside. Use the ED to make the audience feel for the characters and make them want to stick around to get the answers that they seek. Whew. We're finally actually going to talk about the story and the anime now. It is a common rule in the anime community that when checking out a new show to give it the three episode test. Give it time to unveil what it's about and show off its good points. The argument can be made that all you need is one good first episode, but for the sake of having more content in this video, we're going to stick to the three episode rule. So here's what I have planned for the first three episodes. I'll go into detail about the plots of each and how they would work, but this is here to give those who have already read Let's Play an idea of how far in three episodes can get us. In the first episode, we'd have a cold open with Sam narrating over her backstory, how she became a gamer and dedicated her life to becoming a programmer, telling the audience about Indigeneer and how it functions and how it can be used to a game developer's benefit, all leading up to a mass amount of notifications on her phone. Then we see someone on view to playing Sam's game, and playing it wrong, giving it a terrible review. We see Sam's reaction as the video plays in front of her. We then see a huge wave of negative reviews for Sam's game from the VTuber's fans swarming to her page and bombing it, seeming to end her career before it had even started. I think the OP could go here. After that depressing mess, some audience members may be doubting if they are watching the right anime. So the fun and upbeat OP could put them at ease. After the OP, Sam, with red and puffed up eyes from crying, is about to go out and take Bowser for a walk when she bumps into... Martial Law! The VTuber who gave her game a scathing review and whose fans destroyed her future. Turns out he's moving in next door. He accidentally bumps into Sam and knocks her glasses down. And when he goes to pick them up for her, best boy Bowser sees how Sam is uncomfortable with this man and goes to protect. Marshall is not deterred. Turns out, he loves dogs. He picks Bowser up and forcefully lays some loves on him. Sam finally picks up her glasses and takes Bowser back. He hates strangers, so that must have been very dramatic. Marshall goes to introduce himself, but Sam cuts him off. She already knows who he is. Lays down the stats and facts of just how much of a big deal he is. Marshall is very impressed. Sam bluntly says how she's the developer for Ruminate, and when Marshall tries to justify his bad review of the game, Sam makes sure he knows that he didn't play the game right. He played it like a fighting game when it's actually a puzzle game. Their first meeting doesn't end well, as it seems like Marshall doesn't even know what happened. Insert commercial break. Sam goes to the coffee shop where her friend Dee works. She's having a hard time of it all. Sam is feeling bad. Link makes his first appearance, setting up the TP Thief subplot that still hasn't been resolved in a webcomic. But we're getting really close though and my favorite bastard child is involved and I'm excited for it. He sees Sam super bummed out and asks her what's wrong. Sam explains in detail what happened, but Dee and Link aren't gamers, so she simplifies it for them. Her Indigeneer account has been suspended, which means she can't post any new games there now. She's contacted IT, but she'll have to wait for a response. Apparently, this isn't the first time a review bombing has happened. Even if the news went viral, the rating would stay the same. So, it seems that Sam's game is ruined for good. Angela and Vicky walk in and make their first appearance in the series immediately establish Angela as someone who was ride or die for Sam, and Vicky as a comforting character. 
even if it's not in the way she does later on in the series. The three of them grab coffee and head to the park to talk. Angela wants to beat Marshall up, but Vicky tells her that it wasn't Marshall who did it, but his fans who acted on their own. Sam thinks over that bit of information and has a panic attack, needing to grab her inhaler as her asthma starts to kick in. Sam's friends reassure her that Ruminate is indeed a good game and that she shouldn't worry about it. The two of them invite Sam over, but she has laundry to do, so she declines their offer. They go their separate ways and head home. On the way back, Sam overhears two douchebags talking about Marshall's review of her game. Angela calls Sam when she gets back. We see a flashback to Sam going the extra mile to avoid running into Marshall. Definitely gonna need some kind of game reference music here. Sneaky music. Metal Gear, maybe? Though she mentions it was more like a survival horror game, so maybe something more along those lines would be better. There's a knock on the door. There's some tension before it's revealed to be Miss Whipple, the landlady. Their talk starts out fine, but then Miss Whipple pressures Sam into going over to see Marshall and welcome him to the apartment complex. Of course, things are awkward. Then Marshall notices her gamer calluses and brings up World of Warquest, a game that Sam plays with her friends and loves. This sparks joy in Sam before she remembers she's supposed to hate this guy. Miss Whipple invites herself in, making notes of Marshall's strange setup. Sam takes a look around and spots some writing on some boxes. Very not safe for work writing. And this is where the episode would end. Let's go over what's covered here. Introducing Sam and her main conflict with Marshall. How much she loves gaming and how her friends care about her a lot. Her medical condition. Introducing Bowser as the cutest best boy. Introducing Marshall and Link to prospective love interests for the series. Ending it on a curious and unexpected note of the not safe for work writing on the boxes. Getting the viewer invested in seeing what's up with that and inviting them to come back to watch the next episode. Next episode! Open on Sam playing a fighting game and thinking back to the boxes and what she found inside and Marshall's explanation for the labels. Sam and Miss Flippo prepare to leave when Marshall asks Sam for advice on where to get some good Chinese food. It seems like she isn't going to answer, but we see a slight change in her feelings for him when she tells him about Lotus Palace. Sam's about to go to bed when Marshall very loudly starts recording a new video, and he keeps recording until it's past 3 a.m. OP goes here. Sam has to wake up at 5 a.m. Can I get in? Oh no! Her aura is fuming with anger. The next few shots are a pixelated version of her daily routine. Getting ready, taking care of Bowser, Nectar of the Gods. We see her icon moving on a map until she arrives at work. We get our first appearance of Charles. They briefly talk about why Sam is so early to work. Sam asks about the assignments for the next project and if she can work in GUI this time around instead of data entry. Charles turns her down immediately, quite rudely. He's kind of a dick at this stage in the story, but there is a reason for it that gets explained later. Much later. Not in the first three episodes. Then he asks her to make coffee because Lucy is running late. Big oof. Sam's making coffee when the man Umed comes along. They talk gaming for a bit, and they are about to start talking about how Sam's weekend went, but the meeting calls. Everyone gets their assignments for the Ellesmere project. And Sam is data entry. Quick shots of Umed being sad for Sam, and Sam being sad for herself. Lucy appears! Sam's father would like to see her. She's on her way when Umed asks to speak with Charles. Sam goes in to see her father. Things seem pretty intense. But the tongue shifts quickly after Samuel reveals how much of a doting daddy he is. There's a little joke about how Samuel acts like Sam's mother is dead, but really she's just in Florida doing modeling business. Ultimately, it is a very funny scene. He gets Sam to call her mother to see how she's doing. This ends in heartbreak for Sam's poor clingy father. Commercial break here. Cut into Umed and Charles talking about Sam's role in the next project. Accusations are thrown about when it comes to playing favorites and nepotism. Charles tries to state his case, but in the end, Umed gets what he wants. 
Switching roles with Sam. Now he's in charge of the data entry and Sam can do some GUI work finally. Sam is very happy and grateful. Scene change to the coffee shop. Link tries and fails to ask Sam out on a date, mainly because the romantic element of asking to go out on a Friday night goes over her head like an airplane. Link continues to fumble about trying to get a date. D comes in to the rescue. D mentions how Sam hasn't ever dated anyone, and Link doubts his chances at being able to be with her. Sam is quick clacking away at her computer, wondering why the team at Indigeneer hasn't gotten back to her yet. She tries out her new app game and... The art is just stick figures at this point. She'll need to figure out a solution to that. She goes to take a sip of her coffee when Marshall scares her with his video recording again. She fumbles and drops her coffee onto her computer. Mother bear mode activated. Sam goes over to try and confront him, but her anxiety surrounding confrontation stops her. She tries to reason that she can only do it herself and goes in for a POWERFUL knock, but instead slips a note under the door. Cut to a depressed Sam trying to clean and fix her computer. It is the next day. Sam starts to get ready when she sees that Bowser has torn something up. It could be important. She puts it back together and sees that it's a note from Marshall. He apologizes for the noise and says that soundproofing should be there soon. Sam freak out time. Bowser thinks he did something wrong. Turns out Marshall gave a note to everyone in the building. Episode end. What do we got for this episode? We get to see some more relationship building for Sam and Marshall, both positive and negative. Mostly negative. We learn about Sam's job and her grievances with it, as well as her grievances with her father. Properly establish Link as a love interest and an introduction to Charles, another one of Sam's love interests, and a very, very prissy man. Last episode we're going to talk about in detail. Cold open on Sam in the office training Jacob. It's a lot of GUI and color design stuff. Talk about color blindness a bit. The scene ends when Sam gets a text. And it's not just Sam. But her other friends and some people we've yet to meet have gotten a text as well. OP time. Sam goes to check her mail before she heads out to the pizzeria with her friends. Marshall is there too, and he has lost his vocal cords. He just finished up a charity livestream that lasted... 12 hours? Dude. Of course Sam is worried about him. He looks horrible. They talk about the noise and the notes, and how Marshall doesn't actually know it was her who sent it, and Sam has a mild freak out. Mild. Sam leaves in a hurry so that she isn't late for the meeting and loses DKP. At the pizzeria, we get intro cards for Sam and her friends and their characters that they play, plus their stats. I am requiring the adaptation to have some epic game music playing when this happens. And this would be the first look at the CG character models for their in-game characters. Dallas uh, cures his way into the scene, and the women ignore him. Clearly, there is some kind of hierarchy here. A limo pulls up and Olivia and Edgar arrive on the scene. Dallas starts his bad guy bastard routine, but he is swiftly put back in his place with a reminder of what happened the last time he pissed off the healer. <laughs> the team head inside, and one employee recognizes them as the gamer beast that they are. They've been there before, and they had sapped the prize corner of its stock due to their skills being overwhelming. The guildmaster arrives, an absolute unit of a man named Abe. He called them here to celebrate the news that they are now ranked third on their server, and that the top two guilds have contacted them to work together to take on a 30-player raid. It's time for the end game. Dinner is on him tonight. Not literally, but, you know, I wouldn't mind. Angela plays some dance dance with Butterfly playing, another thing to consider the copyright over. Dallas tries to be creepy, but Angela puts him in his place. Edgar is a basketball god, Vicky conquers a zombie apocalypse, and Sam gets a message from Indigeneer. Commercial break goes here. Cut back on Abe messing with an employee and overwhelming a boxing game with an exploit. Edgar makes it rain as Angela asks where Sam is. Turns out Sam is sulking outside. Olivia joins her and asks her what's up. 
good news and bad news from Angie Janier. Her account is back online, but they won't be changing the score for her game, so now she's the lowest rated developer on the site. Olivia wants Edgar to break Marcel's legs, but Sam says that won't be necessary. She's not sure what she's going to do now. Olivia gets to show her full colors in this scene with her sarcastic and blunt way of helping Sam. And it is enough to get Sam to knock on Marshall's door without having super bad anxiety. But Marshall doesn't answer the door. A very pretty and very well-endowed woman answers instead. She completely misunderstands the situation and thinks that Sam is just another stalker fangirl, giving off a massive intimidating aura. Sam clarifies that they are neighbors, actually. Pretty Lady does a 180. Pretty Lady invades personal space. Complimenting Sam on her complexion. Pretty Lady interrogates Sam on her makeup, which she doesn't wear. Then she digs into her bra and pulls out her business card. Pretty Lady is revealed to be Monica, also known as Glitz Kitten, a beauty vlogger. Sam says she's not interested when Marshall calls for Monica. Turns out he was used for a video on her channel, and now he can't get the makeup off. Mood. Sam tries to sneak away, but Monica calls her back to talk to Marshall, now that he's there. Marshall introduces the two of them properly as neighbor and... good friend. He asks what's up, and Sam stumbles over her words as her confrontation anxiety kicks in, in full. Shivering, clinging to herself, gasping for air. Marshall to the rescue, though. He says that he won't be loud that night, since it was bothering Sam before. Nice save! Behind closed doors, Marshall and Monica talk about their true relationship. Turns out they're dating. But Marshall doesn't want his fans to find out or war would be upon them both. Sam was eavesdropping at this point in time, and she hears it all. It's here where it's hinted that she gets a little terrible idea about revealing the truth. And that's the end of that episode. Alright, one last time, what do we got? We see how Sam works on the job. We meet the guild and learn most of their dynamics. We move the Indigeneer plot forward a little bit, and we learn about Monica. A love rival? At least it would seem so to new viewers. And we have the potential for a new subplot about revealing Marshall's secret in order to get revenge. A very enthralling first three episodes, yes? Now to map out the rest of the season. While I was making notes for these first three episodes, I saw that the pattern for what was able to fill in a full episode is somewhere between four to six chapters of webcomic. With that mindset, I went ahead and read the rest of the chapters available when writing this script and made notes of where an episode would start and end. After all that reading and math, this is what the end result was. Seems alright, except we're missing two episodes. Typically, a season of anime is either 12 episodes or 24. If there were just 12 episodes of Let's Play, then there wouldn't be a climax for the season. But part of the story, close enough to filling that 24 episode requirement, only gets us 22 episodes. Never fear, though, I have a solution. Around episode 10 is when the game raid takes place. But in the webcomic, we don't actually get to see a lot of it. I think it would be a lot of fun to dedicate a single episode to just this raid. Introduce more characters and how our characters play together. We see a little bit of it in the webcomic, but in a geeky anime with anime and game references, more game stuff is a plus. And they need to make good use of those CG character models. Might as well show them off in epic gamer ways, right? And Dallas didn't get to show off his good side much there. I'm sure he has a good side. At least he can be useful to the raid, even if it is as bait. So that's one extra episode covered, now we need another. I have the perfect idea, but some of you may not like it. A recap episode. I think putting a recap episode between episodes 18 and 19 would be best, and can be used to the advantage of the production team. Yes, it would give their animators more time to work on the last few episodes of the series and really make sure they look good, but it could also be used to help the story. When watching an anime week to week, it can be difficult sometimes to remember what it was like in the beginning. So a recap episode can help remind the audience of how far the characters have come and how much has changed. Wow, that's what Vicky was like back then? That seems out of character now. 
Marshall really didn't know what was coming, huh? Holy, Charles was a dick. Stuff like that. An excellent example of a recap episode being used in this way is the recap episode in Skate the Infinity. Mild spoilers, but something happens in Skate that makes the main character stop smiling for several episodes in a row. Like, an entire month's worth of weekly episodes. And right after that month of sadness, a recap episode was used to show just how happy this character was at the beginning of the show. The recap episode was a nice break from the arc the anime was in while also being used to make the imagery being used in the current arc more powerful. I'm hoping something similar can be done by having a recap episode at this point in Let's Play adaptation. And with that, we have 24 episodes. Now, how will the season end? I've determined that the best final arc for season 1 would be Marshall and his taco heart and how he almost dies after playing Sam's game and ends up in the hospital. He's okay. A bit damaged, but he's okay. But we can't just end this season with him being okay. Oh no. The viewers need a reason to come back. A reason to buy the DVDs and demand season 2 be made. Right after Marshall goes to the hospital, Sam tries to make a move on Link. Link goes in to kiss her, but finds that he can't. When trying to explain himself, Link says that to him, Sam is not attractive. This breaks Sam's heart, but she hides it as best she can from Link. The love hearts that have been building up get depleted. I don't want to end it on a downer note, though. Sam goes to work the next day, trying out new clothes, and Charles calling her attractive. Even if Sam doesn't believe it. The opening theme would play as Charles gets Sam to do the love yourself exercise, preparing herself for what's to come. If everything goes according to plan when it comes to this upload, then season 3 of Let's Play should have either started or is about to start. I highly recommend that if you watched and liked this video to go and support the artist on Webtoon and on their Patreon. I know I spoiled a whole lot of it. But I haven't given any major plot spoilers past uh, the chapter with the taco heart. And there's still a lot of little character moments that I didn't bring up at all. And I think that would be very enjoyable to read. Do I have more to say about Let's Play? Absolutely! I have ideas for plot points, potential character growth, symbolism, self-insert fanfiction. I mean, what? What? <laughs> you didn't hear that. Anyway, that would be a video for another day if there is demand for it. For now, I thank you for watching.